Can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. So it, it's always a pleasure and, and come and talk at, at events like this. So, and, and the reason why it's a pleasure is because we're doing some really interesting work that I think the public's kind of interested in. So for the last 10 years, as was mentioned, we've been studying juvenile white sharks in Southern California. And, and prior to that, I swear I'd never do that. I thought white sharks are overrated. They got way too much credit. So I've been studying many of the lesser sharks which include tiger sharks and hammerheads and many of the other cool species that don't get nearly as much attention as white sharks do. But I have one of my grad students here tonight, Emily Meese, and we brought some show and tell. So we're actually going to pass around some equipment. You'll get to see some of the tools that we get to use. So the talk I'm going to talk about tonight is actually a project that changed my understanding or feeling about where we're moving in terms of conservation in California. And it all started with white sharks. So the interesting thing is, 25 years ago, if you'd have asked any biologist what kind of shark we thought a white shark was, we would have said, well, they're a coastal shark. And if you asked them, well, how do you know that? We'd say, well, in the fall months, it's not uncommon to see white sharks along this part of the northern and central California coast. And of course, the reason why they're there, and also off Guadalupe Island, off Baja, the reason why they're there is to take advantage of these animals. So the northern elephant seals and sea lions and harbor seals come in and give birth to their young, but it's particularly these critters right here that adult white sharks really like to eat. So they would show up along this part of the coast during the fall and winter months, and that was when biologists would see them most often. So that was really the only thing we knew about white sharks at the time because, frankly, there probably weren't that many of them around, and we just didn't have good tools for studying them. Now, of course, we know the reason why California is so special is because of the habitat that's created, rookery habitat, for northern elephant seals along the California coast. The other thing that we learned about white sharks came from fishery interactions. And of course, California has a rich history in commercial fishing. And that history also translated into a little bit of information about where sharks are found, white sharks in particular, and what regions they could be caught, the times of year they could be caught. But again, that really limited what we're able to learn about white sharks. So from those fishing records, my grad students and I were able to comb through a lot of records going back almost 100 years. And what we found were some really interesting trends. So when we looked through all fishing records, we found that the number one fishery that had the greatest degree of interaction with white sharks was the entanglement fishery, the gillnet fishery, which really started in California back in the 1940s. But at the time, they were using cotton line. And that line was visible in the water. So while a gill net, considered a gill net because fish swims into it and gets caught around the gills, was a very effective method of fishing, when they were using cotton line, it still wasn't that effective. It wasn't until the 70s and the advent of plastic that you could then put that net in the water and it became invisible. And it was a very effective way of fishing. So you can see that of the records that we found, over 88% of all records of white sharks being caught in any fishery were primarily the entangle net or gill net fishery. After that, we had things like set net, harpoon, trawls. And you can see very few white sharks reported caught in any of those fisheries. It was really this fishery. Now, the other thing that we got from those records is something about the size occasionally was recorded. And what we found was a majority of the sharks reported caught in the entangle net fishery are what we call yois. Yoy stands for young of the year. That's a shark less than one year old. So a shark less than one year old is less than 1.7 meters long. So think of that as about five and a half feet long. So white sharks born between four and a half and about five feet long. That's the size at birth. So you can see a bulk of the sharks reported caught in that fishery were young of the year. Then there are some juveniles, very, very few adults. And of course, the only other fishery that we see that's comparable was the recreational fishing fishery. So we can see that this fishery responsible for a bulk of the capture of white sharks. When we look at where they were reported caught, so these blocks that you see are the Department of Fish and Game fishing blocks where a commercial fisher has to report what block they were fishing in. So if we look at adults, these are sharks over 10 feet long. You see a majority of them were caught off the Channel Islands and off Palos Verdes and Catalina, but not very many are caught. And the simple reason for that is an adult white shark can blow through a gill net like it's nothing. So the, the ability to catch a large adult white shark using most of this gear just doesn't happen. However, when we look at juveniles, so these are sharks less than 10 feet, a little bit more than five and a half feet, you see that now they start popping up in these coastal blocks, particularly off Santa Barbara and Ventura, Santa Monica Bay, Huntington Beach, and Dana Point in northern San Diego County. But it's when we look at the yois, the, the babies, we see that it's really these areas along the coast. 
So this tells us maybe something about where these different sizes of white sharks are hanging out. But remember, this is all dependent on where anywhere up to 25 years. So all the places where they occur, they have had protection. So when we go back to the fishery data, and we just take the gillnet fishery, right? Because that was the one responsible for majority of the captures. When we look at the two different fisheries that are fishing that could interact with them, we had an offshore drift gillnet fishery that was targeting shark and swordfish. And then we had an inshore set and drift gillnet fishery that's targeting halibut, angel sharks, and white sea bass. So this fishery, both these fisheries start in the late 70s. And you can see they peak in the mid 80s. So these are the number of nets set per year. And what we see is they peak in about 1985. And then the bars indicate the number of sharks reported caught in those fisheries during those years. So you can see the number of sharks reported caught peak when the fishery peaks, and then it goes down. So in 1994, two really interesting things happened. Number one, the state of California passed legislation that prohibited landing of white sharks. It was illegal to land a white shark. Prior to 1994, all these white sharks that were reported landed were sold. They were brought back, they were sold in fish markets, and chances are if you ate shark tacos back up to the mid-90s, you ate white shark and you might not have even known it. But after that, it was illegal to land them. The other thing that happened in 1994 was the state of California banned the use of gill nets in state waters. Now, this is unusual because normally fisheries management is done by the Fish and Game Commission who then is pointed to regulate our fisheries. However, this, because the gillnet fishery was responsible for entanglement of a lot of marine mammals and birds, boaters voted to ban the use of gillnets in state waters. Now, this is very unusual, right, to have a fisheries management practice voted on by voters. So in 1994, the use of gillnets in state waters, fishing from the shore out to three miles, was prohibited. After 1994, you can see that the gillnet fishing effort has been greatly reduced, 82% since its peak. And it's remained fairly stable. And remember, they can't fish within three miles of the shoreline. But look what's happening in terms of the number of sharks reported caught in those fisheries. So you can see that the number of sharks reported caught in these fisheries have steadily increased. So the question is, how can that happen? So one explanation for that is, well, fishers are maybe fishing in places where they're likely to catch sharks more often than they were before. That's one possible explanation. The other explanation is they were working with us scientists who were requesting them to bring sharks back so we could tag them and study them. The other possible explanation is that this is a sign of population increase. So remember, white sharks have been protected since 1994. Remember I told you females reach maturity in around 12 years. So that's enough time for these babies that are now protected that had to be released to actually reach adulthood and start producing babies of their own. So it's very possible that what we're seeing here is a sign of population increase. And there's a plausible explanation for that. OK, now the other thing that we found was based on new technology. So my colleagues at places like Stanford University and Marine Conservation Science Institute started tagging adult white sharks around these feeding aggregations off and in a wave on the Farallon Islands and Guadalupe Island with a technology called satellite telemetry. So when the sharks would show up there in the fall, they would put these satellite transmitters on them. And using that technology, we could track their movements over broad scales. And what happened overnight was it went from us thinking white sharks were a coastal shark to actually being completely wrong. Turns out these sharks, as soon as the elephant seals left and their food went away, these sharks migrate out to the middle of the Pacific between Baja and Hawaii. And males will spend about eight months of the year out here before returning back to the, one of these feeding aggregation sites. And females may be out here for over a year and a half before returning to places like Southern California and Baja in the spring. So literally overnight, our idea of what kind of shark a white shark was changed. White sharks in, in the Northeast Pacific aren't really coastal sharks. They're actually oceanic sharks because they spend more time in the open ocean than they do along our coastline. So when they come back to the coastline, they come back for two reasons. Remember I told you they come to feed on those nice, juicy northern elephant seal pups. But the other reason why they come back to Southern California is to give birth to their young. And the way we know that is dating back almost 100 years, it is not uncommon for fishers to catch baby white sharks off any of our coastal beaches and piers. So we have fishing records going back to the late 1800s of juvenile white sharks, baby white sharks being caught in Santa Monica Bay by recreational fishers. So we now hypothesize that the Southern California Bight, this area from Santa Barbara down about central Mexico, is a nursery for white sharks in the Northeast Pacific. So starting in 2006, we started a collaboration with Monterey Bay Aquarium, 
who wanted to try to keep a white shark in exhibit. Now, this has been attempted by several aquaria around the world unsuccessfully. The longest they've been able to keep a white shark in exhibit was like five days. Quite often, the sharks die. So Monterey Bay Aquarium has a very strict ethic in terms of what they attempt to keep. So they must do research on those animals to make sure that they will have exhibits that can sustain those animals for the du duration of when they want to keep them. So they contacted us because they knew we lived in Southern California around the nursery. And they asked, can we get access to some sharks that we could tag and figure out what kind of water temperatures they like? What depths do they like to hang out? Where do they feed? What do they eat? So to do that, in 2006, we started collaborating with commercial fishers, who we knew were accidentally catching these sharks occasionally. So what we asked, we asked many of the local gillnet fishers that fish outside three miles, look, if you catch a white shark in your nets, we hold it, put it in your live well, call us up, we'll meet you at the dock. So my students and I could race down, we could meet the fisher, we could assess the shark, we could take blood sample, tissue samples, so we could do genetic analysis. And then we could instrument the sharks with a variety of transmitters. And what we wanted to answer were certain questions. One of the questions was, can a shark caught in a gillnet actually survive after being poked and prodded by scientists and taken back up shore and released? The next question is, if they do, where do they go? So do they hang along the beach? Remember, they're only being caught three miles offshore. So are they out in the channel? Are they in along our beaches? So here's a baby white shark. Here's a commercial fisher. This is one of their fishing totes that they put that white shark in to bring it back. And by using some of that tagging information, we could assess how much interaction is there with a the commercial fishery? Here's a baby white shark being released right off Ventura, actually. And then the next question is, do the sharks stay here all year round or do they migrate? And if they migrate, where do they go? So here's a baby white shark in a fish tote. Those are legal size California halibut. That kind of gives you a sense of how big that little shark is. And then, of course, we wanted to know if they migrate away, do they come back? Do they have fidelity to their natal ground where they were born? So here we are taking some measurements from a shark. We're going to surgically implant an acoustic transmitter, and then we take that shark out and we can let that shark go. So to answer these questions, we use three types of technology in my lab. And one of the things the shark lab specializes in are using these types of technology. So one type are called spot tag. This, is, this actually gets bolted to the shark's dorsal fin, and it's a satellite transmitter. Think of it like a radio transmitter. Every time the shark's fin breaks the surface, this sends a radio signal up to the satellites, which can then determine the latitude and longitude. And when the shark goes into water, it turns off, because radio waves do not penetrate through seawater. So every time it pops up, we can get a latitude and longitude. When it goes into water, we lose it. Now, when we first started putting this technology, Emily's going to pass these around so you can see. By the way, that, that's for an adult. I don't have one for a baby. The babies are smaller tags. But just to give you an idea, those are about $2,200 a piece. And by the way, the most expensive cell phone plan you could ever imagine. Because <laughs> every time we get a detection, I go, yay, until I see the bill. And then it's like, holy cow, that's expensive. So but the bottom line is these aren't, these aren't marine mammals. They don't have to come to the surface to breathe. So when we first started tagging them with this technology, we didn't know how much data we'd get. So we partnered that with another type of technology called a pop-off archiving satellite transmitter. So this transmitter has a little dart, and it gets darted into the shark's back, so it hangs off the side like an earring. It's got a temperature sensor, a depth sensor, and a light sensor. It's a little computer on board, and it's storing that data, recording that data every 30 seconds or five minutes, anytime we want. And then at a pre-described time and date, this thing pops off, floats to the surface, uploads all the data to the satellite, and it turns around and downloads it all to my desk. So when this thing pops up, I can get all that information back. Now, because it's gathering light, temperature, and depth, like ancient mariners, if we know how long the day is, and we have a really accurate clock, we can estimate our latitude and longitude using that. So using that, well, when it's on the shark, we know the depth and the temperature that the shark's moved through, and we can estimate the latitude and longitude. Now, it's not very accurate. It has an accuracy of about 60 nautical miles. So the shark could either be off Long Beach or it could be in Compton. So we can't use it as a really accurate measure, but we do get a lot of information on the temperature that they like to move. So the third type of technology gives us really accurate information about how close they may be, say, to a beach. So this technology is known as acoustic telemetry. And acoustic telemetry uses sound waves instead of radio waves. And sound waves travel really well through seawater. So these acoustic transmitters all have a unique ID code. So every transmitter is unique. So when you plant a shark, it has its own little ID. And then we can either surgically implant these into the shark's body cavity. And the transmitters that we do are these right here. This transmitter will throw about 
about a kilometer distance, so about half a mile, and it'll last 10 years. So we can track an individual from being a baby almost all the way to adulthood. The other type of tags, if we can't catch the shark to do surgery on them, we use this type of tag, which is a dart tag. This one gets dart in the back, so it's like a little earring hanging off the back. And these tags last about three years. And I'll tell you how we go about tagging sharks with this. Now, in order to get the information back, we have these acoustic receivers. By the way, don't carry these through LAX in your bag. You will definitely get pulled into the back room for these. So this is an omnidirectional receiver. So when a shark swims within about 300 yards of one of these receivers, the receiver logs the time, the date, and the ID number. Now, we have to go out and dive to get these back, and then we can download them, and then my students can put them back in the water. But we have these receivers all along the coast, from Avila all the way down to the Mexican border. And any time a shark gets within 300 meters of a beach, where one of these receivers is located, we can log that data. So the transmitters that I'm passing around, the satellite transmitters, those are $4,700 a piece. Uh, the acoustic transmitters are only $400. They're relatively cheap. And those acoustic receivers are about $1,700 a piece. So using this technology, our goal is to answer that list of questions that we have. So if we start looking at some of the data, so here's a map that shows that same California bite, and these are the fish and game squares, right? So the red are the squares, the more gill nets that were sent in these areas between 2006 and 2009. Now remember, this line is the state demarcation line. It's illegal to set nets inside that line. So there's no gill net fishing allowed there. Now the symbols that you see are locations where commercial fishing partners had caught a white shark. Now when you look at that, you go, ooh, that's not good. All the symbols are in the reddest places, and a lot off Ventura, by the way. You have a really good nursery. So the interesting thing is, notice in, in um, Santa Monica Bay, only two sharks were tagged there. Now if you look at this, you would go, this is not good. This would mean that there's a lot of fishery interaction. But remember, the reason why we got the sharks to tag them is they had to be caught in the fishery to begin with. What if we use those spot tags to tell us where the sharks are when they're not being caught? So the next figure I'm going to show you are detections that we got from the spot tags when their fin broke the surface. The white dots you see are detections inside three miles where gillnet fishing isn't permitted. 44% of all the detections are inside this area, many of them very, very close to the beach. The black dots you see are places where gill netting can occur, and what you're going to notice is not all the dots are in the reddest squares. So obviously they're fishing interactions, that's how we get the sharks to begin with. But when the sharks aren't being caught in the nets, they're moving largely in areas where gillnet fishing doesn't occur. So what this tells us is, yes, there's some fishery interaction, but it's not as bad as some people thought. So Santa Monica Bay, look at all those sharks who were tagged in Ventura. They left Ventura, and they came down and were hanging out in Santa Monica Bay during those three years. So um, the other thing we noticed, from any one year to the next, we would find big differences in whether sharks would be found live or dead in the fishermen's nets. So we began to ask the fishers about how they were fishing to try to get more information to try to explain what would happen. And one of the things we found was the fishers would say, you know, sometimes I have to leave my nets out longer than I normally do because I wasn't catching anything or the weather was bad. And what we found was if they left their nets out more than one day, there was a much higher likelihood that a shark could be found dead in the net. However, if they checked their nets in 24 hours, which they normally do to get the freshest fish for you, there was a very high likelihood that the shark could be found live in the net. So remember, all those live sharks that they brought back that we tagged, we put those satellite transmitters in there, and I forgot to mention what those pop-off satellite transmitters do. Those also have what we call a mortality sensor in them. That transmitter is programmed, so if we tag that shark and it goes down to a depth and it remains at that same depth for four days, it's assumed the shark has died and is laying on the bottom. The tag is designed to release and float to the surface. That tells us that the shark has died. So using that, we found that 94% of the sharks that they brought back live that we tagged and released, 94% survived. Now, as a shark biologist, I can tell you that is remarkable. That is truly remarkable. We have no idea how long those sharks might have been in the net before the fishers pulled them. But the fact that those animals could survive that, as long as they were alive in the net at retrieval, that's a really good sign. So again, even though we have gillnet fishing, even though gillnet fishing interacts with white sharks, one of the reasons why the population is probably recovering is the fishermen have to release them from the nets, which they've been doing for, since 1994. 
And we know if they're alive in the net, there's a very high likelihood that they survive. Now, if we waited for fishers to catch sharks in their nets, we might be waiting a long time. So we decided, ah, we'll try it ourselves. So what we would do is we'd hire a commercial purse seiner. These are the ones that go out and catch anchovies and sardines for the recreational fishing. And we'd hire a spotter plane, and we'd spot a shark, and there's a baby white shark, and we'd set the net around the shark, and we could purse the net up. We could take the shark out of the net just like we would if we got it from a commercial gill netter. And then we could work that shark up and release it. Now, from the time we set the net to the time we processed the shark, it would be less than an hour. So we found no difference in the behavior of sharks that we caught this way versus the ones that were caught in gill nets. Now, the other problem that we ran into was we had a hard time getting access to sharks. Now, our, our fish and wildlife permit would not allow us to fish within 900 feet of a public beach. And at the same time, our new partners, the lifeguards, are saying, hey, guess what? We know where the sharks are. They're right here. <laughs> so unfortunately, they were well within 900 feet of the beach. So we would have our spotter plane saying, yeah, I see, tw I see 12 right here. But we couldn't get in there to get access to them. So we need to come up with another technique to get access to the sharks to tag them. So working with our new partners, who are the lifeguards, who are eager to get new information about these sharks, what we'd now do is I would put my grad students on the back of a jet ski tow board. <laughs> and we'd either use a spotter or a drone to tell the lifeguards where the shark was. And then what they would do is they would sidle up alongside the shark, yeah. all into the one of those kids that is the shark's back. Now quite often when they were done, finished tagging, they would stand up and they'd be in waist deep water. That's how shallow the sharks would be. So the nice thing about this technique is we could tag six sharks in, in an hour. They would just be in that same general area. And our biggest challenge was not tagging the same shark twice. So they wouldn't leave. They would just stick around. So um, as you can imagine, my grad students fight for that opportunity. Everybody wants to do it. Um, I tell them, don't tell your parents what we're doing. Yeah. So if we look at some of the other data that we got. So these are, these are going to be data. These are going to be animations from sharks that we use that the pop-off archiving satellite tags. And the black smudge you're going to be see right there is going to be the estimated position of the shark. So here's a shark that was tagged in July in 2007 off uh, Santa Monica. And you're going to see a date counter here. And then the water temperature is going to change. And the redder the water, the warmer the water. So here you go. Here we are in July. Now we're into August. The shark's hanging out up off Southern California beaches, very close to shore, we assume. We get to October, and the water temperature starts cooling down. See that blue? As soon as the water temperature cools down, these sharks start moving south. And they come all the way down to this area of Viscano Bay. They round the corner, and this shark turned around and came back. Now, up to this period, up to about 2015, every single shark that we tagged during the summer in Southern California showed that behavior, that exact behavior. By October, November, when our surface water temperatures dipped below 60 degrees, they headed south for Baja. They were heading for warmer water. So we had one opportunity to do a very interesting experiment. This second shark was caught the same year, but this shark was actually taken up to Monterey Bay and held on exhibit for five months. That shark gained 100 pounds in five months. And the aquarium was getting a little nervous because it was eyeing many of its other very expensive tank mates. <laughs> so they decided that they were worried about being able to get it out of the exhibit safely. So they decided to release it in Monterey in February. Now, white sharks are endothermic. They're warm bodies. As long as they're swimming, they can keep their bodies warmer than the water. So they released it in Monterey in February. Anybody want to take a guess how cold the water is in February in Monterey? Pretty cold. So here's our black smudge right here. Same thing's going to happen. It's going to go fast. Holy cow, is it cold. <laughs> it had to come all the way to Mazatlan to warm up. But this is really cool. See this slug in April? We see the slug of warm water. It actually drives the shark up into the Gulf of California. And that shark goes almost all the way up to the Bay of LA. And then right before the tag was programmed to pop off, our, the sea surface temperature up here was 84 degrees. That shark started hanging out around 100 feet, where the water temperature was 74 degrees. So what this experiment told us is that these baby white sharks in particular are kind of like the three bears. They don't like it too cold, and they don't like it too warm. 
So they have a happy medium sweet spot. So the other thing that we were noticing while we were doing this work is that typically if you see one baby white shark at the beach, you're going to see more than one. They form these kind of loose aggregations, and they're usually fairly close to the shoreline. So this is an aerial photograph. Literally, PCH is just off screen. This would be Will Rogers Beach right here. Here are two stand-up paddleboarders. How many white sharks do you see? Well, that, that's just kelp. <laughs> But, but in an area the size of maybe two football fields, we have counted up to 14 juvenile white sharks, literally just you know, maybe 200 feet off the shoreline edge. So the question that we now ask are, why do they do this? Why do they exhibit this behavior? Why are they hanging out? They're never, you never see them really close to each other, but, but they're never usually more than a couple, maybe 100 yards away from each other. So why do they do that behavior? So to answer that question and to figure out how much time they spend along the beaches, this is where we use the acoustic telemetry. So these are locations of all our acoustic receivers that we have along the coast. We have them all around the Channel Islands. So the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary are partners with us. So we work with them to have a receiver array there. We have them all around Catalina, all the way up to Avila, and then all along the beaches throughout Santa Barbara, all the way down to the Mexican border. And then I have a colleague in Mexico who's studying white sharks down here in this area called Viscano Bay in this big lagoon right here, which is Scammon's Lagoon. So the next figure I'm going to show you is a map from 2015 where suddenly things changed. Prior to 2015, we were seeing a consistent pattern in behavior. And then in 2015, it all changed. And the reason? We had this strong El Nino. So what you're going to see here is an animation. Here's a date and time counter. You're going to see little flashes. Those flashes are detections of white sharks that we had tagged. These tell you how many sharks are tagged at different locations. And what you'll notice is that there's a hot spot off Ventura, Santa Monica, Surfside Huntington Beach, and Dana Point in San Clemente. So what we would see throughout this summer was sharks would move from one hot spot area. Sharks would be at a beach for 40 to 50 straight days, and then would move to another hot spot area, and then move to another one, and move to another one. And normally, in October, November, when our water temperatures would dip below 60 degrees, the sharks would migrate south. But in 2015, we didn't have winter. Our water temperatures never got below 65 degrees. And as a result, none of the sharks left. They stayed. They stayed all year round. The next spring, a new batch of newborns show up, and my phone starts ringing. And the public's going, what is going on? The white shark population has exploded. And we're like, well, it didn't explode. What happened was El Nino changed their behavior. Sharks didn't leave. So, so that gave us some really important information about how temperature and climate affects their behavior. So when we looked at all the sharks that we've tagged over time, so these are the number of sharks. The bigger the bubble, the more sharks detected. These are all our receiver locations. What you see is that there are hot spots. There are hot spots up in Chura, Santa Monica Bay, Dana Point, uh, Huntington Beach, all these locations. And what we found is within a hot spot area, there could be 35 miles of beach. What we found was really interesting is if we just take Santa Monica Bay, we see shifts from year to year between these hotspot beaches within a hotspot area. So in, in 2009 to 2011, Will Rogers Beach was the hotspot. Every shark that we saw was there. All the sharks that we tagged were only detected here. And then in 2012 to 2014, we detected no sharks here, and we only detected them between Redondo and El Segundo. So within a period of several summers, the pattern changed even within a hotspot area. So we now know that there are hotspot areas and that within those areas there are hotspot beaches, but we don't know what will make a hotspot beach a hotspot beach any given summer. So the other thing that we found from the sharks that we planted long-term tags in, those 10-year tags, is that we've been able to track individuals for up to five years so far. So here you have a date counter. Here are all our receivers. All the way down to Mexico, there's a flash. What you'll notice is where you get a flash is when we detected a shark. What you'll notice is, and here you can see the date counter, the shark's a year old. That shark's probably grown a foot in that time. And then by the next winter, it goes down to this kind of bay. And it, it spends all winter in Scammon's Lagoon. And then the following summer, that shark comes back to Southern California. So we've seen this pattern in many sharks. And what's really interesting is by the time they're about two or three years old, they grow a foot a year, so let's say they're six foot by the end of their first year, seven foot by the end of the second, uh, eight foot by the end of the third. You know, they're, by the time they're seven or eight feet, we now see them going to places like San Miguel. Now, in 2015, we actually had juveniles going north of Point Conception. 
which we ne almost never see. And we even had neonates up off babies up off Santa Monica, uh, Monterey Bay in 2015 because the water was so warm. It was 65 degrees in Monterey Bay. So we can see that these sharks made multiple round trips between Baja and Southern California. So we've had two sharks that have done that four years in a row. And by the time they're two or three years old, they're already using the offshore islands, which are where the big boys and girls hang out. So what we thought would be really interesting is taking some of this telemetry data that we use to figure out where these sharks are going, and if, can we make a model? Can we make predictions on where you should expect to find baby white sharks? So to do this, we used our, our PAT tag data. And one of my grad students, Connor White, basically looked at sea surface temperature. We can get sea surface temperature every day anywhere on the planet to a one square kilometer area. And then what we could do is we could use the water temperatures that the sharks were found in. We could use the distance from shore. Quite often they like to stay fairly close to shore, at least for their first two or three years. And then the depth of water that they were detected over. And by using a little simple math, we could actually make predictions on a daily basis on where you should expect to find juvenile white sharks. So what I'm going to show you now is an animation. Here's the date. This, this is, we, we ran this model for 10 years. So here's 2005. What you see is during the summer and fall, Southern California from here to here becomes preferred habitat. And in the winter, Southern California gets too cold. It's the lower part of Baja and the Gulf become preferred habitat. And of course, we're actually able to use this same model for the Atlantic coast. So you probably heard that OSEARCH was tagging juvenile white sharks off New England in the summer. And we predicted based on this model that where they should hang out in the winter is off Cape Palace. And if anybody's following those sharks, you'll know that that's exactly where they're hanging out in the winter. They hang out off Cape Hatteras, and the next spring and summer, they go back to New England. So we're able to use the data that we collected from sharks here to make predictions on where sharks go in Australia. So at the same time we were doing this work, my colleague, who's a professor at, at one of the universities in Mexico, he and his grad students were surveying fishing camps throughout this part of Baja. And, and in Mexico, there are a lot of shark fishing. It's one of the largest shark fishing nations. There's a lot of gill netting. And one of the things they found as they went down, and remember, white sharks have been protected in Mexico for 20 years. So when they're surveying the camps, lo and behold, what do they find? Baby white shark heads. So they asked the commercial fishers, how many sharks have you caught over the years? And you know, the fishers go, ah, oh, you know, I don't have good records. They said, but if you want to know what we're catching, they pointed them towards the desert. And they were like, what are you talking about? So it turns out, fishermen, Mexican fishermen believe you should never clean sharks where you fish because they exude chemicals that will scare sharks away. So they land their sharks whole, they clean them at the beach, they load the carcasses into a truck, and they drive them into the desert. And they dump them at different dump sites in the desert different years. So they pointed them to these dump sites. And what happens is really cool. It's so dry and arid there that the carcasses actually don't decompose. They mummify. So he and his grad students were able to go through these shark dumps and count how many white sharks they had caught in previous years. So they actually did keep records. <laughs> so, so the interesting thing is we've learned from those records that in, in one year, they caught as many as 160 juvenile white sharks in one season. So we know that there's a lot of white shark fishing going on and bycatch mortality going on there in Mexico. So even though they're doing maybe well in the US, remember they are migrating across the border where they're not as well protected in Mexico. So what they found from talking and working with many of the, the commercial fishers there is that these are the locations where they've caught white sharks. And what's really interesting is in May, the same time we start to get babies here, they were seeing babies at the same time in Viscano Bay. What that tells us is that there are probably two nurseries. There's a Southern California nursery and there's a this Viscano Bay nursery. And of course, our sharks migrate down from Southern California and overwinter here, but we haven't had any evidence of their sharks tagged here going up to California, except this summer. We had one shark that was tagged in Viscano Bay this summer that was detected off one of our receivers in Malibu. That's the first shark that we've demonstrated gone north. So now we want to answer questions about what makes a hotspot beach a hotspot. And trust me, our new partners, the lifeguards, really want answers to these questions. So, so we need a better tool. So the new tool that we're developing, I'm working with a roboticist and computer science scientist at Harvey Mudd. And what we are doing is we got a grant from National Science Foundation to make shark tracking robots. So this is off the shelf what we call AUV. It looks like a torpedo, right? 
So we equip that torpedo with a couple of hydrophones. And what the hydrophones are doing is measuring the transmitter sound emitted from the transmitter, how quickly it takes that sound to reach those two hydrophones. And based on that, we can estimate a bearing and a distance. And then we program the robot to swim like a shark, move back and forth. And by the time it gets three detections, it knows exactly where that transmitter is in 3D space and time. Now, we also program the robot to not get too close to the shark because we don't want it to interfere with the shark's behavior. So the robot is programmed never to get within 100 yards of the tagged shark. And we know the sharks can hear them because they have little propellers and they make a bump, 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 bump sound underwater. The sharks actually swim towards the robot. When the sharks swim towards the robot, the robots swim away. And even when they're moving away, they still know exactly where the shark is. And when the shark gets bored and goes about its business, the robot turns and starts following them again. <laughs> so we can also program the robots to move up and down through the water column. So they're measuring temperature, light, depth. They've got video cameras on them. They've got sonar. We can have two robots working together so they can tag team and tracking the shark. So by doing this, we can begin to characterize the 3D environment around the shark and ask, why did it go right? Why did it go left? Why is it hanging out at this beach and not that beach? So the other type of technology we're using we call smart tags. So these smart tags are uh, an invention of one of my grad students. So he made this. So it's basically, think of this as a Fitbit for sharks. So it's got a 3D accelerometer, 3D gyroscope, so we get a little compass heading. It's got a temperature sensor, a depth sensor. It's got an acoustic transmitter on it, so we can follow it using one of the robots or follow it from a boat. And it's got a video logger, so we can actually see what the shark sees. So this thing is designed to clamp onto the shark's dorsal fin. And it's got a little zip tie here and this little magnesium link. So this will stay on the shark's fin for 24 hours and we can follow that shark around. So every motion that shark makes, every single movement is being recorded 30 times a second. So by using this, not only can we see what they're doing, but we can detect how fast they're swimming and the depth and temperatures they like to be at. And then after 24 hours, that thing dissolves away. This thing pops off, floats to the surface. We go pick it up and we can download it. Emily's going to pass this around. So that little baby there um, is reusable, but they're 10,000 bucks a piece. So Whoa. yeah, so be gentle. So, so um, here's one of our sharks released. This is um, in uh, Belmont. Slide the sling forward. Yard. Watch your hand. So there's a shark being released. Those are junior lifeguards standing. There she goes. Going, is it OK? Um, and then nice we follow those sharks for 24 hours. So somebody's in a boat, following them around. And two of the sharks that we tracked basically stayed along Belmont Shore during the day, and then at night would do laps around the offshore oil islands. And then by dawn the next day, would be back along the beach. In our aerial surveys along those areas, we count up to a dozen sharks doing just that. The third shark that we did did something completely different. By about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, my students call me up and say, we're going to need a bigger boat. And I said, <laughs> what does that mean? And they're like, well, we're three miles heading offshore, and we're heading south. So they're doing this out of that 70-foot way. So we take out a bigger boat, and they switch boats. And now, 1 o'clock in the morning, I get another phone call. And they're like, um, we're going to need a bigger, bigger boat. So now they, they're off Balboa Pier, still heading south. So we switch out crews. And then by noon the next day, that shark showed up at Dana Point, where the tag popped off. And then we had a surgically implanted tag in it and receivers all along Dana Point. That shark spent a month and a half. So there, we were able to capture the movement from one hotspot to another, and they made a beeline. It wasn't goofing around. I mean, it went from Long Beach to Dana Point in 24 hours. So by using the co combinations of these technologies, we're able to start to crack the nut. What do these sharks do? Why do they do it? So the other tools we're using, and of course the lifeguards use, these are drones. They're a great tool. So the lifeguards use these to, to go out and see if a shark's been sighted along a beach, if one's been reported, but they have challenges. So we're working with computer scientists and engineers to help develop software for them. So when they fly their drone over a shark, not only can they localize the shark and the drone will track the shark, but it will identify the shark based on its outline and how it swims. So because different sharks have different swimming behaviors. The other thing that we can do using this technology, we can estimate the size of the shark, which becomes really important. Because the lifeguards may opt to close a beach if a shark over eight feet is sighted along that beach. So giving them the tools that would help them make those decisions, help them do their job without having to send somebody out in a jet ski to do that. And of course, we get that science data. Now the other thing we're doing is some of our software programmers, there's a baby white shark, here's a jet ski. The lifeguards used to try to chase them off the beach. You'll see how disturbed they are by that. They, <laughs> they, they just don't care. 
So, um, but the other tool that we're developing is because we know these sharks form these aggregations, what we don't know is, are those social? So by using this software, we can track every individual, we can measure the distance between every single individual, and we can ask questions about how close do they like to get to each other. Are they there because they want to be near each other, or are they there because they want to be in a warm spot of water? By the way, those are not white sharks, those are leopard sharks, but if we had aggregations like that, I would definitely be very busy during the summer. So the other tool, you can't catch and tag every shark. So the other tool we use are called RUBS, Remote Underwater Video Systems. And my colleagues in other places call them BRUBS. That means baited remote underwater video systems. Obviously, we're not going to bait these things around a public beach. So what we do, we call them GoPros on a stick, put them on a PVC pipe. My grad students swim these out outside the wave break and stick them in the sand at about 10 feet of water. They point one camera towards the shore and the other one offshore. They turn the cameras on and they just let them run. So the sharks are actually curious of the cameras, and they'll swim up and take a selfie. So, so based on the selfie, what we can do is we can identify individuals based on these along their sides and along their tail. So we're going to be working with computer programmers to develop facial recognition software for white sharks so that we can start to build libraries and track them over time. So if anybody's a programmer out there, we can put you to work. So um, one of the things that we've found, a lot of people argue, you know what, I don't think there are more sharks out there. I, I think people are using drones and they're using stand-up paddle boarders. They're in ways that they can see them better. It's not that there are more sharks, we can see them better. So I started talking with many of the pilots. So we're, we work very closely with all the helicopter pilots in Southern California, the police department, the sheriff's department, Coast Guard, and they spot for the lifeguards. So when I started to interview those pilots, many of whom have been flying in Southern California for 40 plus years, they say they have never seen more sharks along our coast than they have in the last 10. So now what we've done is we've got some students <laughs> making a cell phone app for those pilots and for lifeguards so that they can record information while they're out doing their surveys that will help us count the number of sharks they see, the estimated sizes, locations, times, and dates. So we can actually track this information over time. So we had pilots doing this all throughout Southern California. These are just the sightings that we had in, in the summer of 2017, and it worked so well that it justified the development of the cell phone app. So this app is specifically for professionals. They're for, for pilots, for lifeguards, folks like that. But we're now, and, and they have the ability to upload pictures and videos so we can confirm their IDs and make sure they're not confusing a dolphin for a white shark um, or a gray whale for a white shark. That would be bad. Um, but we're also working on a public version. So the idea there is we take the skeleton of this and we would make it available for the public. So people that are out surfing or sailing, if you shot GoPro video, you could upload that. And you could just log in the information and by using the public, we can begin to look at sightings and look at where people are seeing animals, the estimated size of those animals. And it becomes a really great public citizen science tool. So the coolest thing, we just did this. This is literally only a couple months old. So many of you probably know that off Padero Lane, there's another one of those shark aggregations. So this summer, we had maybe a dozen plus sharks. We went out and in three or four hours time, tagged six, literally just off the beach. So uh, I have a colleague, Kevin Lafferty at, at, at USGS and, and uh, UCSB, who is doing some work on what we call eDNA. Anybody know what eDNA is? So it's DNA that animals slough off. It's called environmental DNA. So while the shark's swimming around, it's sloughing off DNA all the time in the water. It's excreting it, it's coming off its skin. So what happens is you can take a water sample, you can filter that water sample out, and you can actually run a genetic primer that only matches white sharks. And we did this. So I, Kevin said, I'm gonna go out and sample water, where should I sample? I said, okay, I didn't tell him where we tagged sharks. I said, I want you to sample here, 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 and here. These are up current. So these are places where no sh white sharks have been seen. And these are places where we had tagged three white sharks and had receivers. So he went out, sampled water there, right in the surf, literally waded out, got bottles full of water, took it back. We ran it. What we found were positive evidence for eDNA here, nothing here. This is literally not even a half mile away. So only the places where we had detected white sharks then did they actually get a signature. So the cool thing about this technique, now we can use these robotic catamarans that you can launch from the beach. They have little water samplers on the back. So we can take water samples, we can just have them cruise along the beach, take a little water samples. And eventually this technology is going to move to a gene chip. So in other words, it samples the water, runs across a gene chip, if it's a positive ID for white sharks, ding, and it sends an email out via 
you know, a regular cell phone connection, and then we get a positive ID. So we can do this all along our beaches. So I'm really excited about this technique. So we have some calibration we have to figure out. How long will the DNA last before it degrades? How many, how far away can we detect it? If sharks here in this area, can we detect it, you know, 300 yards, 400 yards down the beach? And the other thing is, the more DNA you detect, the more biomass of shark in the water. So we might even eventually be able to use it to estimate how many sharks are in the area. And then the coolest part is we're now sequencing tissue that we get from every shark that we catch. We might even be able to get to the point where we can identify individuals from these water samples. So this technology is just exploding. And by combining all these tools, we're going to be able to answer many of those questions. So our goal is future real-time sampling for white sharks along our beaches. OK, so now I want to come back to conservation. So for 100 years, we know we've had a history of taking too much from our oceans, right? California was a commercial fishing state. It was built on that. Um, we had issues where we had basically hunted marine mammals to the verge of extinction by the early 1900s. They were protected in 1973 in the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We had dirty fisheries that were, were catching species that they weren't intended to catch. And basically, we had a systematic loss of all predators. Many of the favorite fish that we like to eat fall into that category. So we had basically overfished all these things. So we have had an ocean that has been basically depauperate of top predators for probably 50 to 100 years. It's not that we didn't recognize this problem. We recognized this problem decades ago. So in 1973, because of marine mammal problems, we passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We banned the use of gill nets because we knew it was killing not just white sharks, other species, and marine mammals in particular. The Magnuson-Stevens Act is the Federal Fisheries Management Act. And one of the main things the Federal Fisheries Management Act does is regulate bycatch. And that was a big emphasis in that recertification. And of course, California being the environmentally conscious state that it is, passed the California Marine Life Protection Act in 1999. So we did all these things because we recognized this decades ago. The question we should be asking is, has any of it worked? OK, now prior to this, I would have said, mm, probably not. We hear bad news every day about the state of our ocean, right? OK, I'm just going to use California sea lion as an example. Northern elephant seal, harbor seals, great whales, dolphins, all show the same trajectory. By the early 1920s, California sea lions were hunted to the verge of extinction. It was estimated that only 2,000 were left in all of California and Baja by 1920. Fishermen saw them, they shot them. They viewed them purely as competitors. Marine Mammal Protection Act goes into place in 1973. And look what happens when you don't kill them. They actually increase in number. In the mid-1980s, we had a strong El Nino. And we know that El Ninos hurt sea lion populations. They hurt the moms and their ability to provision their pups. But in the mid-1990s, that, that Magnuson-Stevens Act really cracked down on commercial fisheries that were having bycatch of marine mammals, even though marine mammals were protected since the 1970s. Since then, in the mid-90s, almost all marine mammal populations in California have been growing at rates between 6.5% and 10% per year, which marine mammal biologists didn't even think was possible. And remember, this is happening at a period when we're telling the, telling the public our coastal oceans overfished. Well, many of these marine mammals are some of the most voracious carnivores we have in our coastal ocean. So how are they growing at a rate of 6.5% per year? we completely overfished our coastal waters. Now, in 2012, NOAA concluded that the California sea lion had reached carrying capacity at somewhere between 220 and 470,000 animals. So in a period of less than 100 years, it went from being on the verge of extinction to potentially being fully recovered. So this is not the only marine mammal that has shown that kind of success. Now, probably saying, what does this have to do with sharks? What do white sharks like to eat? marine mammals. So the other reason why white sharks are probably doing as well as they are isn't just because we protected them from being killed in fisheries. Their foods come back. And their foods come back in a big way. So when we look at other species caught in gill nets, giant sea bass, soup fin sharks, leopard sharks, since 1994, all of these species have been showing increases. So just the banning of use of gill nets in state waters has had a big impact on other species. And of course, remember all those species, remember marine mammals are at the top of the food web, white sharks are at the top of the food web. If anything's messed up below, there's no way their populations can grow. And of course, if we have really mucked up water, everything's going to hurt. And in 1970s, 
California had some pretty bad water quality. We had some of the worst water quality that existed anywhere in the country. We were discharging primary treated wastewater a mile offshore, just screening out the big chunks, right? So of course, we also had industry in LA that was dumping hundreds of tons of contaminants into our environment. We have one of the largest Superfund sites in the US off Palos Verdes. So in 1972, that all changed. Californians went and fought hard for the Clean Water Act in Washington. And after 1972, Southern California, which accommodates 22 million people living within 60 miles of the shoreline, all of that gets discharged out eight pipes. So eight pipes. We now have full secondary, in some cases tertiary treatment. We have the best wastewater treatment that exists anywhere in the world for the highest population density. We have cleaner water now than we did 40 years ago, accommodating five times more people. So anybody that says the Clean Water Act hasn't worked needs to look at the data. Now we still have problems, we still have runoff, we still have trash, we have these issues. But we solve this one, we certainly should be able to solve that one. And of course, anything we put in the atmosphere ends up in the ocean. So California had some of the worst air quality that existed anywhere in the country. Same process, concerned citizens fought for stricter uh, air regulations, 1970. The Clean Air Act was passed. And now, with five times more people and 28 times more vehicles on the road, we have cleaner air now than we did 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So these things have been working. Now we still have problems. We still have global climate change. But the, my point, hopefully, is if we can fix these things, we can fix that. So I would argue that we've had a systematic loss of our predators, but there are good signs that they're coming back. Water quality, better management, all those things have helped. But you have to have ecosystem recovery to support them, else they just can't come back. So I would argue the return of our predators is a form of unintentional ecosystem management. All those different things that we've done have worked in concert to help. So I would argue that recovery of the white shark population might be one of California's greatest conservation success stories. So OK, some of you are probably going, I'm not so sure that's a good thing, right? OK. <laughs> So, so the bottom line is we know that shark populations are increasing, and it's not just here. It's not just California. New England, Florida, many places, shark populations are coming back for many of the same reasons. But when that happens, you have to remember that we have basically, and people are seeing more sharks, of course, we have people who have been using the ocean for recreation, and that number of people have been increasing significantly over the last 50 years, who have not had to share the ocean with predators. We've become predator stupid. And we got to change that, right? It's their environment. We're guests in their environment. And we're going to have to adapt our behavior so that we can use the ocean safely and so can they. So we have issues that arise when populations recover. And quite often, what recovery plans don't consider is what happens when animals come back. Do you have a plan? How are you going to deal with that? So examples of this, we see um, people are illegally catching and killing baby white sharks. As their numbers come back, there are people illegally catching them off piers. Um, deliberately, they're going out and targeting them. Is this illegal? Of course. Is this an education problem? Maybe in part, but um, you know, citizens are the ones taking pictures, reporting these things to Fish and Wildlife, and hopefully fines will come out. So the public needs to better understand what's going on. In addition, not only do we have people fishing for them, we have people chumming for them off piers. These are places where people swim. Now, here's the thing. It's not illegal to chum in California, anywhere in California. It's stupid to chum off a public beach, but it's not illegal. So there needs to be some policy changes. As predator populations change, we need to adapt our policies so that people can safely interact with these animals. And we can do so without injuring them. And of course, now in Southern California, there's tourism. So in Dana Point, there were seven boats taking people out to see white sharks, charging people to see white sharks. And that's a cool thing, but it's not regulated at all. So they're chasing the sharks around, and we have to be careful, because if we change their behaviors in ways that make them more aggressive, that makes people at those beaches more susceptible. So it's OK to do these things, but they do have to be regulated. And of course, it all requires better education. So we have a number of different education programs. One of our education programs focuses on the lifeguards who are on the front line. They are dealing with sharks on a day-to-day -day basis. So a lot of the information there are research partners. They help us get that information, and they get it right away. So we work very closely with lifeguards. Their bosses, city councils, are freaked out about sharks. And we, I went to many city council meetings this past year to educate their own city councils about what does this mean. 
and of course, the general public. So there are lots of opportunities for education and outreach. And of course, even K through 12, we're even developing curriculum. So using our tagging technology, we're now teaching eighth graders about physics using tag technology and how to track a shark. So there are lots of opportunities to take this science that we're gathering and not only use it to better improve, make our beaches safer, but hopefully get it to the point where we can share the ocean with the animals that we've worked hard to bring back. So with that, thank you. Uh, so I think we have a few minutes for questions. So if anyone would like to raise their hand uh, and have a question, we'll get them answered. Yes, I lost track. Um, how many total different kinds of tags, we won't count drones and stuff, um, do you use? And the second question is, what do the juvenile uh, uh, white sharks eat? Ah, good questions. So we have um, spot tags. We have PAT tags, and we have acoustic transmitters. Those are the three types we use. And then we have smart tags, which are kind of a mix between a transmitter. It's like a Fitbit. Think of that more as a Fitbit. So those are the main types. And then the question about what do white shark, baby white sharks eat? So we have three hypotheses as to why white sharks like to hang out off the same beaches you like to swim at. Number one, you've got to remember that white sharks, like all sharks, give birth to their young and they're completely on their own. We don't know where the moms give birth to the babies. We don't see big adult white sharks typically along our beaches, but the babies show up along the beaches. So one explanation is, if you're a little baby white shark, you don't know you're a white shark. You're, you're programmed to be afraid of everything. Everything is a potential predator. So where's the safest place for you? Right along the beach. It's shallower. There are fewer predators there. The next part is, you get no instruction from mom on how to eat. All you know is mom packed you with a little lunch box, that liver full of lipid, and you're burning through that until you learn how to feed on your own. The number one thing we find in these baby white shark stomachs are stingrays. They love stingrays. Where do we find stingrays? That's right, in right along the beach, who's been stung? So believe it or not, those baby white sharks are keeping you safe, right? So, so, Many of the stingrays that we have along our beaches are round stingrays. And round stingrays' way of hiding from a predator is they bury in the sand and they hold their breath. Okay, and there are, are literally thousands of them. At certain times of year, there'll be so many stingrays that you cannot see the sand. So for a little white shark, that is an easy place to get an easy meal. And they may feed on stingrays for a couple of years until they become more proficient feeders on other things. Now, they don't transition to marine mammals until they're over about 10 feet. And my guess is it probably takes them a couple years to learn how to take down a marine mammal. They're not, they're mammals, they're smart, they're warm bodied, they're fast, they're nimble. They're a hard prey. We're talking about a cold, well, an endothermic mammal taking down a mammal. That is not easy. So, you know, we often think of white sharks being mammal hunters, but it probably takes them years to learn how to do that. So, but the reason why we think they're in by the beaches, it's safe, there's lots of food, and it's warm. The water's warmer right at the beach than it is 100 yards off the beach. So all those three reasons are our hypotheses as to why they like to use our beaches. Make our way back here. Thank you. Do you know what the mortality rate is for the sharks that have been tagged and could have suffered an infection from the operations and tagging? So we, we kind of know. Um, the only way we can tell is when we put those PAT tags in, right? Because we can tell when they die. Um, so we just, we have a paper that's almost published where we look at mortality rates. And what we found is that 94% of the sharks that have been caught in a net or that we tag uh, survive for periods of up to years. But the satellite tags are only programmed to stay on for 180 days. We can only track them up to that point. Our acoustic tags can track them beyond that point. And unfortunately, those pop-off satellite tags are 4,700 bucks. So we've tagged 30. Do the math on that. Um, that's a very expensive project to get to that point. What we found is that there's probably two of the 30 sharks that we have tagged where we showed signs of delayed mortality. In other words, it didn't die right after we released it. Uh, maybe 60 days later, the tag popped off. And we don't know what happened, what caused that. We've had some, some sharks where only the tag has been found in a gill net, but not the shark. So we don't know whether the shark died and fell out and the tag just got caught. So we can't explain those, but we did have one tag 
that did something very weird. It got warm and it stayed warm even when the tag was going to deep depths, which meant that shark was eaten <laughs> by either a white shark or an orca. <laughs> So we do have one example of what we think a baby white shark was actually predated on. Have you studied the migratory patterns of any of our other local sharks? So we have. So we've looked at leopard sharks. We've done a lot of work on leopard sharks. Um, Emily's been working on horn sharks out of Catalina. So leopard sharks, we've, we've done mainly work at Catalina, and they form these aggregations during the summer. Females will find the warmest water during the day, and they'll hang out there. And, and then at night, when the water cools down, so what happens is during the day, the sun warms up the beach, and the water gets warmer. And at night, the water cools down, and then the females take off. And only pregnant females that do that. So what we found is that during about February, we had sharks that we tagged at Catalina that we then detected. Remember, they had acoustic transmitters in them. My colleagues detected them at San Diego. So those sharks swim all the way across the channel, we had two sharks go to San Diego. We had one go to Alamitas Bay. And then the next summer, they were back at Catalina. So these are five-foot leopard sharks that are swimming across the Catalina Channel. We had no idea that they did that. All right, you said Aventura is a hot spot for white sharks. So can, you, can you be more specific, like which areas of Ventura you're, you're kind of seeing them? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so um, and, and again, I got I to gotta, I gotta preface this. So there are a couple of things going on. So let's just say that the white shark population is increasing, right? So most of the research that's been done has been done at the Farallons, Guadalupe Island, where we know there are high densities of adults. They are feeding on marine mammals. Um, we know that the babies are showing up along our beaches, and we know historically that they've been using our beaches. And when I say that, I say we're talking about areas kind of between halfway, you know, Padero to about Ventura, just south of Ventura Harbor. Right? And then there are probably some points you know, from Santa Barbara Harbor to Goleta where we've detected some juvenile white sharks. Now where things get different are adults. So normally we don't see adult white sharks along Southern California beaches. And, and the reason for that is because the marine mammals aren't along our beaches. Our rookeries, our big marine mammal rookeries around the Channel Islands. Now, here in your neck of the woods, you are closer to the Channel Islands than the rest of Southern California, which means you're just a hop, skip, and a jump from, from those rookeries to your beaches. So what we've noticed the last few years, based on pilot records and lifeguard records, is that you guys tend to see more adult white sharks occasionally along your beaches than are seen in the rest of Southern California. However, based on tagging data, and there are not very many of those sharks tagged, they don't appear to stay. They probably just pass through. So it differs depending on where you go. In some parts of Southern California, we find primarily babies. This year, for, for the first time, we started seeing year one, year two, and year three sharks. So those are just not only babies. Those are six, seven, eight, and nine footers. So off Padero, most of the sharks we were seeing were in that seven to nine foot range. And off Dana Point, we had a lot of sharks in that seven to nine foot range. So that's the, that's the best I can give you now. Hopefully in future years with more tagging, we can better answer that question. Can't say. Can't say. But um, the only thing I can tell you is with more sharks in the water over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of people in the water, and I haven't seen people's behavior change. So um, we're not seeing people getting taken out left and right, which is a good sign. So if you're a surfer, I would keep surfing. But use common sense. Don't surf by a dead whale. That's a good one. Um, stay together. Stay in groups, right? Those sorts of things. You know, when it's really murky, like when we're doing work down off Dana Point, there's a beach there where the water gets really murky. Like if you're sitting on your board, you can't see your feet. So there, with nine-footers swimming around, I tell people that's probably not a good idea. If you have good water clarity, I think your chances of an accident go way down. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Lowe, so much. I'm going to give him another round of applause.